right, good evening. Tonight we are going to be in chapter 17.1 in our video notes. Our topic is genetic variation, and we're going to explain how genetic variation can act directly on evolution and how genetics and genes relate to how things are changing over time. And so we're going to be talking about genetics today. And so we need to remember about our genetics unit, about DNA, and remember kind of what the components of them are and so we'll start really big so we have this huge chromosome remember this is a chromosome a duplicated chromosome actually and if you zoom in it's a bunch of condensed DNA so here is our DNA and then if you zoom even farther into DNA DNA is made into uh, genes which is our fragments of DNA and if you zoom into a gene genes are made of nitrogen bases or nucleotides and every letter is one nitrogen base in a nucleotide. And so that's just some background information to review of what we sh what you should have already learned about genetics. So some background vocabulary to remember again is um, genotype. Do you remember genotype? It is the combination of alleles. And so when we write genotype, we use letters. So we have, let's say, homozygous dominant would be two capital letters. Heterozygous genotype would be a capital and lowercase, and homozygous recessive would be two lowercase letters. And so genotype um, and the environment conditions can produce a variety of different phenotypes or physical traits. So remember we talked about how the genes and the environment could impact what the phenotype looks like, and so we're going to be talking about that today when we're talking about evolution and genetics. And so we need to remember what causes genetic variation in a population. Why do we all vary and why are we unique in our genes and in our phenotypes? And so these are the three sources, mutations, sexual reproduction, and lateral gene transfer. And so we're going to talk about each of those now. So the first primary reason probably why there is unique random variations that happen in a population is because of mutations. So we need to remember that mutations can produce changes because it's in our genes, and if our genes code for proteins, that can change the trait. And so our phenotype may look different. And so your phenotype may uh, affect how fit you are in an environment, or it may not affect the fitness. And so some mutations can be lethal to the organism and may lower their fitness, and so they're not able to survive and reproduce. And some mutations are actually beneficial, and they are best fit for the environment, and so they are going to be able to survive and reproduce. So mutations uh, matter in evolution when and only when they are beneficial, where they are able to survive and pass down those mutations to the next generation and to the next generation and to the next generation. And so it's important to remember um, that these mutations are the beneficial ones that are going to allow the organism to be best suited than the other organisms in their population. And so we just need to remember, again, that mutations that we are going to be focusing on are the ones that are inheritable, which means the mutation must have been in the egg or the sperm to make that new organism to inherit that mutation to their offspring, and then their descendants also have that mutation as well, or the potential to have that mutation as well. So now let's look at, at, at how variation can exist with sexual reproduction. And so you have already learned about how we vary genetically when it's about sexual reproduction. So remember, heritable differences that are not coming from mutations are just gen, gen, genetic recombination from what we did in our meiosis unit with crossing over. Crossing over happens when we all make our sperm and our eggs, and that's recombining and changing our genetic information. And so an independent assortment, again, allowing those chromosomes to independently move during the actual meiosis process, um, where they independently separate from each other and you get half the amount. And so both of these uh, processes is in the process of sexual reproduction, and that's going to also increase why we have different variations in our genes. So this increases the new genotypes that might come around, come around and this is also why we all you look uniquely different and that's another reason why we have genetic variation. The last one is called lateral gene transfer which is also something you have heard before. It's just 
changed in a different way. You remember transformation? That's kind of what lateral gene transfer is. And so it's basically when organisms can pass their genes from one individual to another. It's not, it's not um, their offspring. It's just like a cousin or um, a neighbor, essentially. And so organisms from the same species can can where this can occur and some organisms of different species where this can occur and this can also increase genetic variation and where you can get new genes and so if you kind of like I think I know what you're talking about because we've talked about this transformation in bacteria where bacteria will spit plasmids and genetic information into another bacteria cell and change that bacteria okay and we've also used this process with bacteria spitting DNA into something else when we're talking about genetically modified organisms. And so this can also change an organism and increase variation in a population if this happens naturally in the world. All right, so we're going to talk about now how um, populations and gene pools are up in, in regards to evolution now. And what is that all about? And so a gene pool, so some vocabulary, a gene pool um, consists of looking at all the genes and all the different alleles that are present in the population. So not just one individual gene in an individual, but all the genes that exist in the whole population. So here's just an example looking at these um, organisms here with the big bees and the little bees and looking at how many of those total are present in the population. That's what a gene pool is. And so the relative frequency of an allele, that's you're going to hear that word especially in our lab on Monday, but relative frequency, how frequent is an allele showing up in our gene pool? Which allele, the capital or the lowercase, is showing up more or showing up less? And can you increase your frequency of alleles. Can you increase how often the big B is present versus the little B is present? And so you can compare this number and look at it. And so for example, here is some pictures of some rabbits here. And we have the frequency of capital A versus lowercase a allele in this population. And you can see how after over time, which kind of allele is showing up more often in, the, in generations to come and generations to come. You're seeing an increase in the capital A gene frequency allele, and you're seeing a decrease in the lowercase a allele. It's because it's looking like the white phenotype is not best suited for the environment, and so over time, they're going to be passing down the capital A allele to their offspring more frequently than they are with the lowercase a's. And so we're going to be talking about that a whole lot more. But when we look at evolution, we're going to look at how that change in relative frequency of alleles in a gene pool in a population over time. That's what we're looking at is because natural selection is happening, how is that changing at the genetic level? What is happening to the alleles in the population over time? And so we um, need to remember that um, researchers have discovered the heritable traits are controlled by genes. And so these changes in genes and chromosomes generate these variations. And so we need to remember that if an allele frequency change happens, it could be because of a variation change, a new mutation happened. And so a new allele might show up in a population. So. How is genotype and phenotype rel related to evolution? Well, I want you to remember that natural selection acts directly on phenotype, not genotype. So our genes code for our traits, but phenotype, the color of the outside fur, the behavior that they complete, the chemical makeup that the organism has, that is phenotype, and natural selection is going to act on phenotype, not genotype. So some individuals, have phenotypes that are best suited for their environment and so those will be the ones that are most likely going to be able to survive and reproduce. And so the more offspring that they can pass on those copies of those genes and uh, the most likely that those genes will show up in the next generation and you might see an increase in frequency of alleles. And so here's an example. This is a gene pool of some mice and you can see the frequency of alleles the brown fur allele, you can see, is quite more frequent than the black 
fur allele. So that must mean that the brown fur phenotype is um, best suited for this environment at this moment in time in that environment. So natural selection, again, operates on individuals, but you do not see individuals evolve. You see populations evolve. So changes in allele frequency will only be shown up. We'll only look at it if we're looking at the whole population. So we don't look at individuals when we're looking at frequency of alleles like one little mice, capital A and capital lowercase b. We're looking at the whole population because that's what evolution is about, the population changing over time, not an individual. All right, so again, again, remember genes are controlled by phenotypes, okay? And so usually we have uh, a trait that would code for one gene, or I'm sorry, one gene would code for one single trait, um, but the number of phenotypes that can come out of that trait and have that variation depends on how many genes control that trait. And so now we're going to talk about um, what is the difference between a single gene trait and a polygenic trait. And we, we kind of remember this. But a single gene trait is referring to how there is a trait and it's controlled by just one gene. And usually you only get about two to three different phenotypes from that one gene. So for example, in us, um, hitchhiker's thumb, that's one gene and you have just kind of two different thumb positions, essentially. In snails, here is a picture of snails in uh, patterns of their uh, shells. There is either banding with rings or completely no bands at all. And this is an example of a single gene trait. There's only two to three phenotypes. There's not that much of variation in that just type of trait. So there is this misconception that I want you to make sure you understand that the dominant phenotype is not always going to be the greatest frequency. You're not always going to have capital letters be the most frequent in your population. Sometimes recessive alleles are greater in a population. It all just depends on what's best suited. Is that phenotype best suited for the environment. So just have this again that looking at the snail banding, um, the single gene trait again um, you can see that we have bands and no bands, and actually without bands is the dominant allele. Not having bands on a snail shell is dominant, but with bands is the recessive. And you can see in this graph right here that there is a higher frequency of little bees in the population of snails than there are with the big bees. So this is an example that not everything is going to always be dominantly uh, the highest frequency in the population. Sometimes the recessive can show up. All right, so polygenic traits. Poly, many, many genes. So when we talk about a polygenic trait, remember it's controlled by two or more genes. So if we're talking about a trait that has many genes, you're going to see many different phenotypes. You're going to see huge variation in phenotypes. And that's kind of our example with hair color and uh, skin color. You see all these different shades of hair um, in our population because there's so many genes that contribute to that. And so if you look at human height as an example, um, you usually see polygenic as a bell-shaped curve um, because there's just so many variations. There's kind of the average in the population, but then you have kind of the ones on this side and the ones on this side. So let's say this is like short right here. And then the other side is tall. Can't really see my good handwriting very well, but tall. And so this is kind of the average. But you see that there is um, this variation. And there is a whole um, lot more uh, genetic variation in population when you have polygenic traits that you're dealing with. Example, the pocket mice video. The pocket mice fur is polygenic. There's many genes that contribute to it. And so you see different genetic, different shades of browns and you see darker blacks and uh, that kind of variation. So we are going to review these notes in class when you return, but um, be ready to talk about frequency of alleles in a population because we will be doing a lab demonstration on this when you return.